Hello and welcome back folks to English 280 with Dr. Uh, Matt Barton. Uh, in this lecture I'll be covering video game aesthetics. And if you've taken other courses and heard this term, you might think we're talking uh, strictly about the visual look of something. Uh, people tend to use it that way. They'll talk about the aesthetics of a car. You know, is, it a, is it a sports sporty look or is it kind of a clunker, <laughs> clunky looking boxy car? Uh, or the aesthetics of a toaster. Is it sort of look high tech and sleek or is it sort of chrome and nostalgia uh, uh, vintage look uh, so what we want to do here and these these authors want us to go beyond just the look of something to also get at the feel uh, of something as well so it's the way a game uh, those elements that have some impact not just on the way the game uh, plays but the way it, it sort of makes us feel uh, as we play it so at least that's the way I interpret what they're getting at uh, so we'll get more into it as we go. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be talking about the relationship between a game and, and rules, uh, what you can and can't do in a game, how you win and lose, and so on. Uh, the game's geography, or the game world uh, that's represented there, uh, is it 2D, 3D, uh, how is, uh, you know, what parts can you explore? Uh, we'll be talking about whether a game is single player or multiplayer and what difference that makes. And then we'll get in briefly to some of the stuff like augmented reality, uh, pervasive gaming, uh, things like Pokemon Go and, and more. So a lot of good stuff here. Uh, I want to start by having you think about your favorite game's aesthetics. Uh, so think about, not just again, not just the way that it looks, but the way it makes you feel as you play. And so that's going to cover things like, uh, well, the rules, you know, what you can and can't do in that game, but also the graphical style. Is it sort of cute? Uh, is it scary? Is it serious? You know, I think about the audio in the same way, the type of music that's in the game. Uh, whether it's a single-player game or a multiplayer game. Uh, so all of that stuff, just think about it, and then think about what would happen if you made a drastic change to one of those elements. How would that affect the uh, your experience of the game? So ponder that for a while, then come back, and we'll continue. All right, so here's their definition of this word, uh, aesthetic. So they're saying it covers all aspects of the video game experienced by the player. So the key idea there is it's, it's our experience, uh, not just what's what's there, but how we experience what we're doing <laughs> as we're playing this game, what's sort of happening to us, how is it making us feel. Uh, and they bring in uh, audio and graphics there, as well as the, the rules. You know, again, what are you trying to do in this game? What are you not allowed to do? Where can you go, etc.? All that also has an impact. Uh, so not just the look and feel, but how it plays, the elements that actually make up games. They talk a little bit here about Doodle Jump. So I don't know if you've played this, uh, but you can see just from here these uh, screenshots how it's it's kind of got this look of a drawing, almost kind of a rough draft of a game. Uh, and they say that a lot of people like this, the sort of way this makes them feel as they're playing this. It doesn't feel like other games. Uh, so they say that might be something that makes that game stand out. You know, whereas, of course, other people wouldn't go for this style. Uh, so it's a way to kind of get at that dimension of games. And they've got some good stuff here at the beginning. I like the example of the chess. Uh, so let's just look at their terms here, then I'll give you some examples. So they talk about the rules of a game, and they define those as the defined limitations that determine what you and other characters in the game can or cannot do, and which actions or events increase or decrease the game score. Uh, so chess being a good example of that, if you play chess, you know, you can't just move your pawns uh, wherever you like. Uh, there's, you can move them uh, two spaces at the beginning or one space after they've uh, moved, and uh, there's ways to capture other pieces. I will uh, <laughs> get all into it here. Uh, but the point is all games will have something like that. Like here's a legitimate move. Uh, this is an illegitimate move. You can't do that. Uh, if you play Dungeons and Dragons, the rules come up all the time, and usually the players will have their... Uh, handbooks there, ready to argue with the DM, you know, or the game uh, GM, uh, depending on <laughs> even the, what the person's called might be uh, different, right? Uh, so there's uh, that dimension, but also notice this part about whether it's uh, helping you win or lose. You know, I was uh, if you watch the Super Bowl, you know, I'm, I'm bringing in non-video game examples here. I uh, hope that's okay. Uh, but with the Super Bowl, there's always these moments where they're like, well, what happened there? Does that count as a point? Uh, was that uh, out of bounds, you know, that kind of discussion is always coming up, and that's part of the experience, I would say, of watching that. Uh, it's more than just uh, the rules. Part of that is interpreting the rules. 
And no matter how many rules there are, there's always that sort of wiggle room. Uh, and then, of course, in some video games we talked about, there's really no way to win. It's just you're kind of it's kind of a simulation game, a process game they've talked about. Uh, but nevertheless, there's rules that dictate like what you you can't just put your uh, city anywhere you like uh, in a civilization, for example. Or can you? <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking about the mines. But, but anyway, moving on. Uh, geography and representation, so the uh, space of the game, the world space, you know, is it trying to simulate an actual tennis court in a tennis game? Is it something fantastic? I uh, think about games like Mario Kart uh, versus the more realistic uh, racing games out there. You can say, well, they're both, it's a, both games are a racetrack, uh, but the way those racetracks are represented, very different in a, you know, these uh, <laughs> Need for Speed game. Uh, versus the latest of Mario Kart. Uh, also, where you can go again, can you go off the screen? What happens if that ha if you go off the screen? Is, is there places that you can't go? Uh, is there a fog of war so you can't see the whole screen at the same time, uh, all at once? All those kind of factors. And then again, the the number of players. And so I like their example of the chess set because uh, what they were saying is you could have a chess set that's a very sort of standard traditional looking piece you know like the knight there and the and the the castle or the the rook uh but there's no reason that the pieces have to look like that you could have a star wars theme set uh, they i think they even said they, there's a barbie doll uh set <laughs> i know there's some mario brothers sets and uh, so you can really change the look of the pieces uh and you of course have a custom board made out of whatever you like now the rules will stay the same, it'll still be chess, but I think anybody that would say, yeah, it does make a difference when you move from like a Star Wars or a fun set like that to just the standard pieces. Uh, it somehow, it makes a difference. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to pin down, uh, but, but that's what they're getting at here, right? And the 2D and 3D, same thing. If you, you could have a chess game uh, that was uh, in 3D, uh, where you were, I guess you could sort of move around the board, you know, look at the pieces from different angles. You know, that might be kind of interesting, but uh, usually you don't see that in chess games. Uh, at least the ones I played, it's usually a very, uh, just kind of almost a diagram of the chess board. Okay, so moving on, let's uh, think some more about rules with the one of the simpler games out there, Tic Tac Toe. So you can actually play Tic Tac Toe with Google uh, for free. There's a link there. I'll have to put the link in the uh, the question but just open that up play a few rounds and see if you could figure out you know if you've played tic-tac-toe before you probably know the rules uh, but otherwise you, you could figure them out pretty quickly just by playing it uh, so think about the you know to what extent those rules determine or shape influence the experience uh, is there more to the game than its rules uh, so that's a, that's an interesting question too so what is it that makes tic-tac-toe fun you know, a lot of kids especially like to play this. Uh, is it because the rules are there? Is it something about the rules that makes it fun? Uh, or is it something else or some combination? You know, I, I don't really know. So <laughs> is, I thought you might have some fun exploring this question on your own. But uh, I'd like to see what you can come up with for this. Uh, so a little bit more then about the rules and how important are game rules to understanding a game. Uh, some game studies types say this is really the only important thing. You know, that's what makes a game a game instead of a, a movie or a book or something else. It's, it enables you to do certain things and cuts off other streams. There's a way to win this game or you can do badly at a game <laughs> in a way that you can't really do badly in a movie. I mean, you, you watch the movie and I guess you could not follow it very well or keep uh, getting distracted. Uh, but it's not the same as playing a game. I think we could all agree on that. Uh, so there are different ways to think about rules in games, different systems scholars have come up with to analyze these uh, rules and rule types. And it gets pretty complicated as you saw in the book. Uh, the Rules of Play book by Salen and Zimmerman, uh, they talk about a formal system of a game, which that's what they call the rules, sort of the format or the forms. Uh, versus the phenomenological levels, which you can see the root, uh, root of that being the phenomenon, what you perceive, your perceptions as you're uh, experiencing the game. 
Uh, so again, coming back to this idea of chess, you can see, remember when we were talking about ontology before, uh, there's this uh, question about like, what is chess? Is chess just the rules of the game? Uh, or is chess something that you do? And is, is it chess uh, only as you're playing this thing with somebody and you're having this experience? Uh, or is it just memorizing like all these different rules? And that's what chess is. So it's kind of, I don't know if you quite follow what I'm trying to get at there, but <laughs> scholars like to draw a, a distinction between that experience versus the the rules that define the game. And you can do this for uh, any game. Uh, so they define a rule as, quote, an imperative governing the interaction of game objects and the possible outcome of this interaction. So when you're designing a game, I have a screenshot here from Unity to kind of get at this uh, a little bit better. So I don't know how experienced you are with designing games or 3D, uh, uh, 3D games in particular, but you can see here we have this cube a simple cube, but there are options, components that the designer can decide to plug into this to make, make basically decide what is this cube going to do. And the one that I have uh, checked here is called a box collider. And so what this does, it puts a what's called a collider around that box so that it can tell basically when something touches this cube. Uh, so it could be your you know you click on it with a mouse or your character runs into it. And so you're basically telling the game that there's going to be some rules associated with this uh, box. Uh, you could just turn off the collider, and then it would basically just be uh, for decoration. <laughs> so, and, you know, you've obviously played games before where there's a door. It's just for decoration. You can't do anything. Uh, whereas in other spots, you can actually open the door, and it does something. And so these are, it's kind of hard to think about this maybe, but these are basically rules that we're setting up. We're deciding like what we want you to be able to do with this cube, how will players be able to interact with it, will they be able to do anything other than just look at it, uh, can they pick it up, can they move it, can they climb on top of it, you know, etc. And so these are all what they mean by, by rules there. Uh, Jasper Jewell, he's a name that comes up quite often, so he's got his system of rule types. So he talks about a game state, rules that cover the basic aspects uh, basic aspects of the game state sort of what I was showing you just a second ago. Uh, so you got those kind of rules. Then you got outcome valorization. And so that's, I don't know why the language here is so turgid, uh, but basically, how do you know if you're doing well at the game? Is it good? Are you doing badly? And to kind of jump into the game audio, you know, a lot of games will have sounds that play. You know, did I just pick up a treasure or did I just get wounded? <laughs> and so they might have like a nice pleasant ka -ching sound if you're doing something good. And whereas it might be like Arr! if you're doing something, uh, you know, if you get into some trouble in the game. So uh, that could be an outcome valorization rule. You know, which sound plays at what kind of event. Uh, then the information, which is something that uh, Jewel talks about in his book. Uh, so that's the information. So how do you decide what the player should know? And again, if you played something like StarCraft II, uh, you don't see the whole map. Right? You only see the parts you've explored. You have to go off, and same thing with the Civ games. Uh, the more you play the game, you reveal uh, more of the map. You know, a lot of games are like that. Uh, versus this Pac-Man game here. So let's see if I can show you this. So the uh, with this game, you, can, you already see the whole gameplay. The whole game world is just revealed to you all at once. You can see where all these ghosts are. Now you could imagine this this game of Pac-Man. Let me back it up here a little bit. Uh, so what if you could only see through uh, Pac-Man's line of sight? Which means you could see this ghost here, but since uh, Pac-Man's facing that way, you wouldn't be able to see the stuff going on behind him. Uh, you wouldn't be able to see these other ghosts. Uh, maybe you could only see like a little piece of the maze where the, the Pac- the Pac-Man, or where Pac-Man Pac is. Uh, so that would be these information rules. And same thing, like a role-playing game. Uh, some of the role-playing games will actually tell you what you rolled. They'll say you rolled a 20 with a plus four bonus to hit, and you did 12 points of damage, or you took you know so many points of damage. Uh, where other uh, role-playing games keep all that stuff hidden from you, and they just uh, represent it in some other way. So you don't know exactly what you rolled. Might just say you missed. 
All right, let's uh, move on then. Uh, Salen and Zimmerman's rules, uh, so yet another system. Uh, they talk about constitutive rules, underlying formal structures of a game, which define its basic dynamics, the core math of the game, the game logic. Uh, basically, I'm interpreting this one as the stuff under the hood, right? The code that you don't actually see as a player. You can sort of figure out how it works by, by playing the game. Uh, the operational is what they say is what most people mean by the game's rules. Uh, basically, what's in there to direct you or nudge you in a certain direction. You know, how do you operate the game? Uh, you can play a game without ever looking at the code, right? You don't necessarily need to know uh, the formulas and all that stuff going on behind the scenes that the computer's calculating for you. Uh, you're just there to play. And then the, I think what's interesting about these, uh, this set of rules is this last one here, and the implicit rules. Unwritten rules we take for granted. Uh, so these are ones that it's not really part of a code. It's not really uh, an operational rule per se. It's just almost like etiquette, I think is one way to think about this. I uh, said so there are all sorts of things in, uh, if you play massively multiplayer online games. Uh, if you're in an instance with people, you're part of a raid, uh, there's you don't just quit in the middle of a raid. Or one of the things I was thinking of is sometimes you have a you're in a in a dungeon with a group of people, and uh, one of them will DC or disconnect. And so basically they they had a computer glitch or something, so they're kind of frozen there. And there's uh, usually there's sort of an understanding that if you DC for a certain length of time, uh, they'll kick you from the party. So you'll just be booted out, and then when you come back, you'll be outside. You'll have to run the instance again. You won't get any credit for doing it. Uh, so that's one of those unwritten rules, and some people uh, don't enforce it. You know, they just don't care if you DC. Uh, other people want to kick you right away. Uh, and then, But mostly, there's usually kind of a little conversation about what's an appropriate length of time. Uh, so I thought that's something I haven't really thought too much about that aspect of gaming. but So I like this uh, rule set. I like the idea of this implicit rules. It's uh, interesting. Uh, <coughs> now the textbook authors, uh, what are they, uh, <laughs> Engelfeld, Nielsen, and Smith, and Tosca, uh, they just have these two types of rules that they go by, uh, what they call interplay rules, determining the relationships and the properties of elements in the game, the physical laws, and so they kind of want to uh, combine some of those other rule sets just to have one. Uh, so interplay, you know, how you play basically in the evaluation rules, how you win, or what gets rewarded and punished. That's uh, so a lot of games. Maybe there's no way to win it definitively. You don't really win World of Warcraft, for example. Uh, but you certainly get rewarded. You know, if you're doing well, you get more gold, you get better items, you get more, uh, you get opportunities to do increasingly difficult things content, uh, or you get to see content that other people don't get to see, uh, right? Whereas if you're dying all the time, you get punished in various ways. There's basically like getting sent to timeout some t in some of these MMOs. Uh, so there's usually some way to tell, like you sort of evaluate how you're doing in the game. Uh, SimCity, you know, these authors keep wanting to call that like a procedural game, make out like there's no way to win it. But uh, I would disagree because in that one, now, one of the things about SimCity was that made it cool was that you had all these charts. You know, it's basically like Excel spreadsheets and things. And you could you could pull up and see like how your taxes are doing and, you know, and whether how people's incomes are being affected. Uh, so it got it literally was like line graphs and things, bar graphs you could pull up to see how you were doing. Uh, so I think you could really have a lot of fun playing around with these concepts. Uh, then they give a couple of terms that you hear all the time, not just in game studies, but if, even if you read game reviews. Uh, one of the things that comes up all the time is this idea of gameplay. <clears throat> and they, you know, they're quite correct to say a lot of people use this term. They very few times will bother to define it exactly what they mean by this. It's one of those sort of understood terms. Uh, usually what I hear it referred to to mean is uh, to distinguish it from things like the graphics of a game, so let's say, well, this game has great graphics, it has great music, uh, great uh, storyline is great, uh, great voice work, you know, all this stuff is great, but the gameplay stinks. <laughs> you know, that's the sort of way they'll say. And what they're talking about there is just, I guess, if you want to talk about game dynamics, 
Uh, there's just something about the rules, you know, the combination. It's just basically not fun, uh, right? It's it's frust too frustrating, or it's uh, we'll get into this the concept of balance in a, in a minute here. Uh, there's just something that's kind of off about it. It's a boring, you know, the or it's just not rewarding. It feels clunky, awkward. And so maybe there's some aspects of uh, interface in this as well, or uh, input controls. Uh, but something about it is just not right. Now they define gameplay as the game dynamics emerging from the interplay between the rules and the game geography. So again, I guess this idea of the the sum being or the uh, the whole being greater than the sum of its parts, I guess is kind of what they're saying there about gameplay. And so it's not just the rules, it's not just the look and the feel of it, the aesthetics. It's kind of the, everything kind of comes together uh, as you're having this gameplay. You can just look at the word to gameplay. You know, it's what you're you're playing the game. You're sort of in the moment. Anyway, it is a tr it is kind of a slippery term. Uh, game balance is a little more uh, a little easier to wrap your head around this one. Uh, so this is they define this as ensuring that a winning a game should be a function of player's skill, plus whatever luck system the game allows. It shouldn't be related to the game's initial conditions. And I just say this is basically how fair is the game? You know, is it? They got a. They talk about rock paper scissors in there. I talk about rock paper scissors lizard, lizard Spock. <laughs> Uh, Big Bang Theory, they play this variation. So if it's a well-balanced game, you know, you, you could play the Spock, you could be Lizard, you could be Scissors, and you still got a fair shot at winning. And if it's an unbalanced game, then you could just say maybe Spock, every time you play Spock, you win. And Spock wins every time. Well, that wouldn't be very fun because everybody would just do the Spock thing every time and it wouldn't be much of a game. Uh, and they find that Sometimes these games are so massive, they're so complex, that there's not really time to fully test out every possibility. Uh, this comes up all the time in online games. Again, World of Warcraft, uh, but you name it. Uh, you know, somebody finds out a way, like if you play as a hunter, and you use this particular set of talents or abilities, or you have this particular piece of gear, uh, you're going to just crush everybody else every time. Uh, so if, when people figure this out, they they either say, well, let me go create a hunter and I'll copy this uh, method. Or they'll say, that's stupid. I really like playing my shaman. I don't want to switch to a hunter. I hate you. <laughs> uh, they say, this game is unbalanced, you know, because of that. It should You should be able to play any class you like and still, you know, be competitive. Uh, so that's what they're talking about there with the, the game balance. It comes up in real-time strategy games as well. Shouldn't matter what faction you play, uh, you should still be able to do well against the other factions. It shouldn't just be one faction always wins. Uh, question three. So here's another question for you about the graphics you know, as we get into this topic. Uh, so what do you think about graphics in art style in a game? We've come across some people like Espen Arseth springs to mind. He says that the game, that, you know, the graphics don't really matter. Uh, he was talking one time about Lara Croft in Tomb Raider. And, you know, when that game came out, a lot of game studies, uh, people got excited about it. And there was all the sort of feminist criticism around the Lara Croft and her, uh, you know, being a female avatar and uh, sort of the, her, even like her bodily proportions and all this stuff. So people, there were a lot of ink spilled on this topic of uh, Lara Croft. And R. Seth was saying, that Lara Croft doesn't matter. Uh, that has, you don't even really think about Lara Croft or see her as you're playing Tomb Raider. Uh, you're just thinking, like, can I make it to that ledge? Oh, look, there's a tiger. <laughs> you know, it's not really, uh, you don't really spend too long. Maybe somebody watching you play uh, would study... Uh, Lara, but you as a player would, would not even notice. So I always thought, I think Arseth might have been on to something there, really. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily agree, but I think it's, I see where he's getting, what he's getting at there. Uh, this idea, if you sort of see through the character uh, as you're playing, you don't really spend a lot of time looking at the character. Uh, but anyway, what do you think? Do you think graphics are just kind of for decoration? 
uh, not really. You could have a game with crappy graphics or great graphics, but you know it's, it's about the gameplay. You know, some people will say you could have crappy graphics and still have a great game. Uh, other people say no, you got it backwards. Uh, you could have as, as long as you have great graphics, it's a good game regardless <laughs> of how it plays. Uh, so, what do you think? What are your thoughts? And I have some a little video here with Madden, so you can see some of these Madden games over the years. Uh, so there's, I'm not sure which one that is. But anyway, that looks, that might even be one of the ones from the 80s or early 90s. And we can skip on and you can see how the, over these different versions of Madden, the graphics get more realistic. Let's see, that one's, yeah, there's one from obviously quite a bit later. You know, so there you go. If you played Madden over the years, you probably have a favorite version. You know, Madden's kind of interesting to me for that reason, too, getting back to this question. You talk to somebody that's played this game <laughs> for decades, <laughs> all the different versions. You know, a lot of the times they'll have a favorite Madden. It's not the latest one. You know, they'll, they'll like one of these earlier versions for whatever reason. And so that's kind of interesting. We normally think the better the graphics, the better the game, but not necessarily. Anyway, I'll shut up, let you answer, and we'll come back and move on. Okay, then they start breaking down this geography and representation in a couple of uh, different ways. And you know, when you're designing a game, this is all stuff you want to figure out pretty quickly, right? Is it going to be a first-person game? Is it going to be third-person? Usually what people mean by that is if it's first-person, you're seeing through the eyes of a character. Something like uh, Halo, you don't really see Master Chief. You see him in the cutscenes, uh, but as you're playing the game, it's just like you're kind of looking out his... Uh, it's like you got his helmet on, you're kind of looking out that way. Uh, whereas a third-person game, I would say, uh, well, Gears of War uh, springs to mind, or any game where you see the character on the screen. Of course, uh, Life is Strange. A lot of adventure games uh, fit into this third-person category. Uh, because you kind of want to see the character's face and see how they're in body language, right? And see how they're responding to situations, uh, the drama unfolding. Uh, whereas if it was first person, uh, you don't get to see those reactions. And some of the video games we talked about before, Myst, for example, was first person. It was almost like you're there in the game. Uh, Doom, you know, same thing. Uh, whereas a lot of other games are third person, like those, uh, the King's Quest series, the uh, uh, Secret of Monkey Island, you know, you see the character kind of there walking around the screen. And so that's what this first category means. And then they've got isometric versus top down. So let me just show you this. We've got Gauntlet here. So you can see this is an arcade game from, uh, I think it's from, yeah, 1985. <laughs> Uh, but you can see it's almost like we got this sort of like we're way up above the action. We're looking down. Uh, we can see him. Uh, see this elf archer. All right. Now, then we, over here we have Diablo, which I believe this is early or sometime in the 90s. These ads. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the idea here is it's kind of like at an angle. They talk about this kind of being like architectural diagram so it looks more three-dimensional it's not really three-dimensional this is all flat uh, flat graphics but the way they draw it makes it look more three-dimensional so it's you know you've probably seen lots of other games like this sometimes it can get a little tricky to see like where you are you can sort of get discombobulated uh, playing these isometric games but it's sort of a nice compromise for many people between this top-down view uh, versus a full 3D game, which really wouldn't have been feasible at the time. Uh, but anyway, that's an isometric game. Move on. Oops. Uh, so they talk about the need not to, or they caution us against fixating too much on whether a game is a first-person game or a third-person third game. You know, they got things like the over-the-shoulder games. Where it's sort of like a first-person shooter, but you can sort of see the person's back a little bit. Uh, other And then like the Gears of War, where they're kind of off to the side a little bit of the Mass Effect game. So they say don't get too into the weeds about whether it's first-person or not, uh, or first-person perspective. 
Now they want to talk about first person or third person perception. Uh, so what basically what the point from which the player perceives the game space. So it's a very subtle point they're making here. Uh, I thought one game that might sort of show show you what they're talking about is Alone in the Dark. This is one of the early 3D games, true 3D. So these are actually 3D models, not uh, 2D. So if we look there, it's a little bit blurry, but you can see the character. This is the player's character here. And as you're walking around, you only see the, the scene. Basically, you see what the, uh, the player can see, or this character can see from this room. It kind of makes it feel like a horror film. And they do talk a lot in the cinema sometimes. You'll be able to see things that the character can't see or the actor uh, can't see, you know, something coming up from behind. Uh, so it's kind of like that in this game. You know, we are sort of restricted in our field of view. I can't just move the camera around wherever I want. So it's a fixed camera perspective, but I can move the, the character around. And so they talked about that. And then other games, uh, the real-time strategy games, for example, you might be up above and you might be able to zoom the camera in and out and fly all around and see a bunch of other stuff that your character can't actually see, but you can see. So that's a little about the different kinds of perspectives and perceptions that you might have available to you. Uh, a lot of games like to limit you to what your character can see. Uh, they think, like, you know, the line of sight of the character is also what the player sees. Other games, uh, they're not so strict, and they'll let you, you know, get other kinds of vantage points. So let's see, the video games, most video games are 2D or 3D or somewhere in between. Yeah, I guess there's not a lot of 4D <laughs> or 1D games. <laughs> uh, but the 2D games, uh, they're still quite popular. You know, there for a while they were saying that, well, 2D is obsolete. You know, everything's got to be 3D. Uh, not true. A lot of people are making good money with 2D graphics. Uh, so you can see here is uh, a product called Game Maker where you can make these uh, sprites yourself. Uh, so basically the sprites are these little, or I guess a combination of these uh, images uh, on a sprite sheet they call it. So you can sort of make it look different if he's going to the right or if he's standing still or if he's looking at it from behind. Uh, so you can switch around you know, as you're moving your controller around. It gives us an impression of kind of like a cartoon animation. Uh, but it's not really a model. It's just all these different little images that get uh, put in, you know, substituted for the one before it at the appropriate time. Uh, so the 2D games uh, have vectors or rasters. We talked about that last time. Uh, these are the raster style. You know, if I could zoom in here, you could see these are little dots called pixels, you know, that make up that image. Uh, whereas the vectors are you know, formulas basically you say I want this to be like one third of the screen and this part to be two thirds uh, so unity for example they have a you know the, when you're setting up your user interface uh, you could say I want it like so many pixels here and so many pixels there uh, but you could also say I just want it to go you know one third the way across the screen and I want this to be like <laughs> proportionately this far from the other window <clears throat> and the advantage of that is it doesn't matter if somebody's, if somebody's playing it on a tiny screen, you know, it'll move everything closer together. Uh, but if they have a nice big screen, you know, it'll keep it from getting like tiny. <laughs> you can still see everything and take a better advantage of that uh, display size. Yes, and if you're working with the 2D graphics, you probably will use a tool like Photoshop or a dedicated sprite making tool. Uh, so that's the 2D. That's, you know, think about most games of the NES and the SNES were 2D games. And then uh, later games would probably be more likely to be 3D. So even if it uh, looks two-dimensional, they still might be using 3D models. Uh, so, you know, the, the Metroid series, there's some Metroid games where it's still, you're kind of looking at it from the side. There's, you know, it's still a basic platform game. But the models are actually three-dimensional. And they made it with 3D software. And you could do, a lot of people do this with Unity. Uh, you could have a two-dimensional game but you're using a three-dimensional graphics just you know just because some people are more comfortable with this it's a lot easier I think in some ways to animate three dimensions in a, with a program like a blender that we're seeing here uh, than it is to do that cartoon style animation where you actually have to draw all the different like steps if you're walking you know you have to have a different 
you have to draw like each step has to be a different cell uh, whereas with 3d program like this you could just put the bones in there what they call bones and rigging system and you know just kind of create it you could, you could mock it up in this system and then just have the computer uh, play that at the appropriate time you could basically it's computation computational <laughs> Uh, and there's some programs you could use to make 3D objects. Maya, Blender, uh, 3ds Max comes up a lot. Uh, Blender here, this is the one I use. It's uh, just because it's a free program. These other ones can cost thousands of dollars. Uh, you can get free versions as a student, but then there's some limitations about uh, making a commercial product. But you know, as you can see, just from looking at this interface, I mean, this can quickly get. Uh, complicated as all get out you really need to know some geometry I think and some trig to really get the full benefit of something like this but uh, I would ar also argue though even with the 2d graphics especially if you're using something like Photoshop or, or GIMP is the free version of that uh, that can get complicated too so it's not like one's necessarily easier than the other it's just a very different skill set and here we have just some 2d versus 3d games uh, so this one, you know, just looking at it, you might not see it. Well, it doesn't look all that different. Uh, this one is Icewind Dale. And so I think it's about 98, somewhere in there. So with this game, you, I don't know if you, I don't remember if you can zoom in and out, but these are all sprites, you know, like I was showing you before. They have these sheets of setup so that when they move, it'll switch to a different uh, sprite. And that's the way it kind of simulates a three-dimensional look. Uh, but I can't just spin the camera around and like see what's on the other side of this statue here. <laughs> you know, we're kind of locked into this uh, perspective, uh, this kind of isometric view. Whereas the Neverwinter Nights over here, that's what made that a big deal. Was you now you can zoom in. You have a camera. You can move around. You could see uh, spin around, look at the other side of uh, the characters here. Uh, we could zoom as in as close as we want on objects or zoom out. Uh, and you can see there's kind of a trade-off. Like to me, this one, if you look closely, it doesn't look quite as realistic in some ways. And in some ways it looks more realistic. Uh, that's because with this one over here, the sprites, uh, they can make what they call a pre-rendered backdrop. You know, so the artist could come in and draw this exactly the way they want it, get the lights exactly the way they want it. Uh, whereas with the when you have the computer doing it instead, you might have sort of unrealistic lights going on and uh, you know sometimes it doesn't look as good as the uh, 2d style but it's getting kind of esoteric <laughs> we'll move on uh, so here's another question for you so think of a series you've played that had 2d and 3d versions uh, metroid uh, super mario you know he's had games where he was in two dimensions and then other ones where he's in 3d same thing with zelda uh, so think about any series like that and then how do you think that transition affected the gameplay experience? Like with the, if you played Mario 64, do you think this was more immersive? Did it pull you in more uh, than the earlier Mario games? Or maybe you've played a Mario or Metroid game on a, on a handheld device and then you switched over to the console version, maybe noticed a difference. Uh, just what do you think about that. Another kind of interesting point on graphics is the 2.5, or the, there's different kinds of names for this, but basically a faking of 3D. And a lot of the early first person shooter games, or really a lot of the early games, they didn't really have the processing speed and the memory to make full 3D. Uh, but they basically had ways they could sort of fake it. Uh, so one of those techniques is uh, called the billboard. So you can see, if you look at these trees, you know, if you just kind of look at them casually, you might think, oh, those look great. But if you look closely enough, you see that's really just a flat image that's just repeated over and over. And the way that they make it look like you're further away, they just shrink uh, the image to make it look like it's further in the background. Uh, but this is a very cheap technique in terms of processing power. And the computer doesn't really have to work too hard to represent this. Uh, whereas if these were actual 3D models, again, with, you know, full sides where you go all the way around, look at uh, the tree from different angles, uh, that would require a lot more power. So that's why you see this kind of graphic, this kind of style on a, a lot of uh, iPhone games or handheld games might use something like this. Uh, 
or low budget games. Uh, whereas the more sophisticated the game, it's probably more likely to have that full 3D. Uh, another technique is the parallax scrolling. This is an early example, Moon Patrol from 1982. Uh, so when I play this, what, look at these uh, mountains in the background. Let me just play this. Again, a lot easier just to show it than to explain it. So if you see what's happening here, we have these different layers, and they're moving at different speeds. Right? So this one up front is moving along with the uh, uh, the vehicle. The one when you got these sort of city, this alien-looking city behind that moving uh, a little bit slower, and then the mountains in the very back uh, moving really slow. And they, I've seen this compared to the effect of when you're a kid and you're riding in the, on the bus. <laughs> You sort of look out the window, and it looks like uh, the stuff that's further away is moving slower. You know, it's kind of trippy as a kid to see that. Uh, but that's that parallax effect. So these early video games, I mean, 1982, they were able to use this, again, as fairly cheap in terms of processing power. You just roll, you just have this sort of slightly longer uh, graphic than the screen, and then you just kind of roll it and repeat it over and over again. So it doesn't take a whole lot of... Uh, processing power to do that but but it looks cool and certainly at, at the time this was like mind-blowing whoa <laughs> it looks so it's so deep it looks like it's 3d and really kind of uh you know drove people crazy to see that uh, another aspect is the exploration uh, so how 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 free are you to explore the world of the game can you go anywhere you like uh, are you restricted from certain areas? Are you sort of forced to keep moving? Uh, this is a 1942 here. Wasn't made in 1942. <laughs> 1984. Now let's get a good look at that. Oh, these commercials. Now so you see what happens here with these, uh, I call them shmups or shoot 'em ups. So what happens, you just take, when you're designing one of these games, you take a very long sort of graphic uh, that goes up and down, uh, but you only sort of gradually roll it down uh, for the player to see it. So this plane, you know, you can't go backwards and see what, what happened before. You can't go off to the sides. So you're kind of stuck on this almost like a, like a, uh, a conveyor belt, I guess is one way to think about this. It's like a conveyor belt at the grocery store, right? <laughs> Bringing the groceries <laughs> uh, down. Uh, so it's it's pretty cool. It does provide some, uh, you know, I always kind of like this kind of game because you you want to play it to see like how far you can get and you kind of, the reward is getting to see more cool stuff. <laughs> you know, parts of the map that your friends haven't ever seen before. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Uh, and then other games of this style, some of them are from the side. Uh, some of them do let you go, you know, anywhere you like. I think Time Pilot was mentioned there. Uh, and then over here on the right we have Metroid. I think this is a great example of exploration in a game. And they've sort of kept this up in Zelda's the same way. A lot of the later Zelda games kind of pick up on this idea. But you can't just go anywhere you like. Yeah, look at the way this, the screen happens too. Look when he goes, or she goes. <laughs> See? So that's the different kind of a scrolling they're talking about. So it's yeah, here you can sort of keep going, but then there's those transitions as you go to the different rooms, and then it'll, like, all this, the screen will move. So it's using some techniques to try to keep the, uh, the memory limitations and the processing power down. But what I like about Metroid is, let's see if, this, if that's what's going to happen there. You get these powers, basically. You know, one of them lets you turn into a ball, and then some of them will let you freeze things. Uh, but what's so cool about the game is that as you get these new abilities, you can figure out how to get to parts of the game you couldn't get to before. So you, it lets you explore more of the game as you're getting these new abilities. And I always just thought that was just a super cool uh, gameplay idea. You know, I still like to play the uh, the Metroid games for that reason. You know, same thing with the Zelda uh, games. It's what makes them. You can see even you go back to areas that you were you saw at the beginning of the game. Uh, but now you have this new tool, and you can see parts of the level that you didn't see before. Uh, it's just super cool. 
Uh, time, uh, the authors say that really there's not a lot done on how time works in games. You know, obviously some games have a slow pace, almost like chess, <laughs> uh, whereas a lot of other games are very frantic, uh, very uh, you know action games. Uh, there are a few games, though, that do some cool stuff with time. Uh, Life is Strange is one. Uh, here's one called Braid. Let's see if they'll show this in a minute, but you can rewind time. Yeah, look, I think they'll show it here. So he dies, but then there's a... I forget what button you press, but you can make it go backwards and reverse. So that's one of the gameplay mechanics of this game, if you will. So there's not a whole lot of games, I, I think, that I could come up with that do something interesting with time. Uh, those are certainly two of them, though. You know, one of the things the book pointed out, too, that I thought was, I think it was Jesper Jewell again, it comes up a lot in this book, but he was talking about the save game. So if you can save a game and then load the game, he says that kind of interferes with the, the pace of it. You know, a lot of uh, game de developers, they don't like you to save too much. You know, they'll, they'll even put save points or restrict you from saving in certain areas because they want it to feel more, they want you to feel that tension of like not being able to go back and you know, fix something that you screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whereas other developers, they don't care. All right, the graphical styles. So this is the one that most people assume is the holy grail, uh, this photorealistic look. And, you know, you should just have the game. The best game would be one that just was looked completely real, indistinguishable from reality. You know, that's the goal. Uh, as we'll see, though, it's not really the goal for a lot of uh, designers. and A lot of gamers, they don't even like this style. But but that's the idea. It looks just as real as a photograph would look as though a camera were there. Uh, we certainly see that uh, with the Madden series again. And they break the categories down a little bit more, which I think is smart. So they, they talk about televisualism. Uh, so something that looks like a TV uh, show. If you watch the... I was thinking about this as I was watching the... Uh, the Super Bowl, and I have written a lot about this Madden series and researched it. And one of the fun things about the Madden series is it's not just about uh, looking realistic, but they're trying to make it look like it was uh, a broadcast game. So they'll put things in. Like I noticed at the Super Bowl, uh, they had the dro every now and then you can see these drones flying around. They're trying to get the aerial shots, and I don't even have to look. I'm, I bet you anything, uh, there's drones flying around in these uh, Madden games. Do they need that? Does that in any way add, you know, they, they obviously they don't have to show a drone. Uh, they could just let you flip to different viewpoints. It's a game. <laughs> you could do whatever you like. Uh, but the, they don't really want it to be that. They want it to be more like it was uh, watching TV. So it's what I'm trying to say, basically, is they don't want it necessarily to look realistic uh, so much as they want it to look uh, like a television broadcast. And a television broadcast isn't really... Uh, a, naked uh, a naked depiction of reality either. Uh, there's all this uh, stuff that's on the screen that sort of helps you make sense of what's happening on the field. And so there's a lot of abstraction in between you and the game. And so I hope not being uh, too uh, confusing with that point. But let's just you know click here. I'll show you. So you can see that to the, the lengths they've gone to make this look like you're actually watching a game on television. You know, all of this stuff, I would say the goal is, to, again, to imitate that experience more than just putting you in the eyes of a player. And you see even like the shaking of the camera there. I don't see a drone yet. I want to see if they have a drone flying around. <laughs> Let's see, there's the... Well, maybe they don't have it yet. They should. They should get that. Remember the, the Super Bowls used to have these cables that were running across the top of the the, uh, the field and they would uh, have cameras mounted to those and they'd be zipping along. And I know for sure that shows up in some of the Madden games, uh, even though it's a game. They don't have to have the cables. You know, they could just have the camera floating in midair if they like. But anyway, that's enough on that point. And then the, another side of this that's interesting is the illusionism, which that is trying to show something realistic but it's not really realistic because the thing doesn't actually exist. Things like dragons. <laughs> you know, what? 
people play Dragon Age and they say that dragon uh, that looks so realistic well I mean think about it for a minute what does that even mean you know dragons aren't real uh, so they come up with this term illusionism uh, I think it's a little bit silly everybody knows what you mean if you say that dragon looks realistic uh, they don't really need the separate term for that but you know there's always going to be the academic hair splitter <laughs> Uh, graphical style, uh, number two, is caricaturism, which again is a weird term. I don't, I've never heard this outside of this book, but uh, if you think about a caricature artist, you see it in political cartoons, and you're like, well, that's that looks like so-and-so, famous politician. Uh, usually they'll have a giant nose or you know, whatever you notice when you look at that person. Usually they're funny. Now, I think it makes more sense to just call it cartoony style. And if you are a developer, if you're doing some indie development, you're on Unity, or you're working with uh, Unreal 3D, you might see something called the low poly style, uh, which as far as I can tell, it means basically the same thing. So if I go to Unity, type in low po or Unity a store, look for low poly style, you get something like this uh, World of Warcraft building. Now, I don't think anybody would say that looks realistic. It looks, it's not that it's goofy looking, uh, but it's it's definitely it's more somewhat more cartoony, you know. They're, obviously, they're not trying to make this look like a, a Lord of the Rings, exactly like the movie. <laughs> uh, and a lot of people prefer this style. You know, it's the same thing with comic books, right? Or cartoons. Some cartoons look very realistic, just like a regular, like they're real humans, real actors. Uh, but then other ones are very obviously cartoony. They're not trying to look realistic at all. And you can't say one is better than the other, right? Uh, you know, I, was, I like the Batman TV show. I like Batman the cartoon. <laughs> it doesn't really bother me that uh, the cartoon doesn't look super uh, photorealistic. Uh, and, you know, there is an argument to be made that the more cartoony something looks, the more relatable it is because the you know, you can look at that cartoon and it kind of looks, you sort of your brain sort of fills in these details that aren't actually in the cartoon itself. Whereas if you're looking at an actor on TV, you sort of identify it as, well, that's <laughs> that's an actor. That's Al, I always think of, that's Al Bundy. Uh, I was watching a, was it Modern Family? It just came to me. <laughs> I don't know what the name of that actor is, but it's kind of hard to distinguish the uh, the actor from the role sometimes, even previous roles uh, they call that typecasting. Anyway, uh, I don't know where I'm going with that. Let's look into the third one, abstractionism. So I guess they felt like they needed an another category here. Uh, I guess because some of the best games fit into this style. Uh, Tetris, you know, I don't have to show you that. I did get to interview the creator of Tetris, uh, Alexei Pashitnov. Really fascinating uh, gentleman from Russia or the Soviet Union actually at the time. Uh, but that's just basically shapes. And he actually was inspired by an actual little game of uh, pentominoes, I think they called it, uh, which is basically a little, little uh, well, you've seen the game. <laughs> uh, quicks being another one, very, just kind of lines, making shapes, it's filling in things. Uh, Tempest is another one. Uh, here's one called Geometry Wars that was pretty popular in versions of this. But you can see that's just basically shapes, geometrical shapes. Doesn't really look like a realistic spaceship that you might see on uh, something like Star Trek, right? So it's very abstract graphics. You know, and every now and then you'll see a game fit into this style, and some people love it. Uh, they do make a good point in the book about it's kind of hard to describe it. It doesn't really look so exciting if you're just looking at a screenshot of it. Uh, a lot of this doesn't get you know, a lot of these games like uh, that Geometry Wars, you play it, you might have a much better time than, uh, than you think just by looking at screenshots of it. Uh, so here's a question along these lines for you. Uh, so again, think about some of your favorite games. You know, is it a photorealistic game? Is it cartoony? Is it abstract? And then imagine what it would be like if they switched the styles on you. So they maybe they remade the game, but instead of being cartoony, now it's like photorealistic. Or maybe it was realistic before, now it's cartoony. So they go all, uh, they have fun with this sometimes. Uh, Final Fantasy is kind of infamous for this. You never know, quite know what the next game in the series, what style they'll be going for. 
Uh, so just think about that and the impact that it had. All right, so just a few last things here. Let's see, a little over, getting close to an hour. I think we can do it. Uh, game audio. So some of you folks have, have asked me about this already. You know, a lot of people are excited about game audio. Uh, the book tells us, though, quite rightly, that a lot of uh, a lot of developers don't even really worry about audio until the end. It's just kind of almost an afterthought. Uh, it certainly doesn't get a lot, a lot of attention. And again, it's one of those things that's kind of hard to write about. Uh, you know, if you look in a game magazine, they can't really talk about music. We don't really, unless you study music, uh, you don't have the terminology to really describe it in any effective way. I mean, you could say, oh, the music's awesome. <laughs> it's got a rock beat. <laughs> uh, but where do you go from there, right? I just don't have the terms. Uh, but it is an important aspect of games, and I think most of us, uh, you probably know at least a few game uh, themes. You could probably uh, whistle at least or hum. Uh, here's one of my friends, uh, George Sanger, also called the Fat Man. And he was one of the great innovators of game audio. Uh, he really did a lot, especially on the PC side, to get games out of this uh, bloop, 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 you know, style. Uh, he, was, he really wanted people to buy sound cards and have digital sound effects in their games. And then uh, when the seventh guest and those games came along on CD-ROM, he was actually able to record songs like with his guitar, his piano, uh, and real singing, you know, put those all into the games. Uh, so that's certainly part of it. Uh, vocalization, a lot of games now will have voice actors come in and that's, you know, big business. The sound effects, I think, add a lot. You know, try playing a game with the sound muted and you'll quickly probably turn the sound back on because it's just not as much fun if you can't hear what you're doing. And I think, too, a lot of the sounds of uh, games like, oh, like Mario, you know, you get the coin, it makes a sound. Or World of Warcraft, when you level up, you know, it makes that nice sound. <laughs> and it really adds to the experience, I think. Uh, ambient effects. Uh, so these are sounds that don't, like, they're basically this there, kind of like the equivalent of a decoration. You know, you might hear stuff like distant birds singing or wind. It uh, doesn't really... Uh, have any impact on the game play itself but it's just there to kind of add atmosphere or ambiance uh, to that and then of course music you know that i don't really have to tell you what music is but and of course that uh, has a big factor uh, in this in games and some games will use uh, spatial audio and what that means if you have the headphones on or at least stereo sound uh, you know you can hear whether something's on the left or the right of you and some people think that gives an unfair advantage even if you have uh, this surround sound headset on. Uh, then you can like tell if someone, something's behind you. You know, if a player's trying to creep up from behind you, you'd be able to hear that turn around or turn around the game. <laughs> uh, whereas somebody that had the sound muted, you know, they wouldn't be able to pick up on that. So, you know, especially for players that don't have, uh, you know, good hearing or hard of hearing or deaf, again, developers, it's one thing they, they really want to make fair uh, for everybody so they have different ways to uh, still developing techniques but trying to make again level the playing field for everybody uh, which brings us to balance which we'll get to in a minute uh, just a few uh very last things uh, emergence this is a term that i guess again thrown around a lot uh, what they're talking about here is stuff that the gameplay designers didn't anticipate and so it's not built into the rules but clever players, you might be just messing around one day and find out, hey, you know, if I do this and that, it lets me do this, you know, and I can go uh, outside the realm where I'm supposed to go in the game, or I can do things that I'm not supposed to be able to do. Uh, so here's the classic, the rocket jump. Uh, so you get the rocket, uh, rocket launcher. Let's see if they'll show you this. Yeah, and if you zoom, like you jump and zoom, or jump and shoot it like the, uh, the force of that impact kind of throw you up higher. And there's a little bit of debate about who came up with this technique or whether uh, the designers of the game really anticipated it or not. But basically it lets you get to places where you weren't supposed to <laughs> be able to get to. <laughs> you know, a lot of people had fun. It kind of got worked into a strategy. Now, of course, it's kind of essential that you know how to rocket jump uh, if you're playing one of these games. But... Uh, who knows if that was actually intended by the designers? 
you know, they don't mention that if you look at the manuals and things. Uh, or did that just emerge? Did play did that just kind of emerge out of people playing it and talking about it and just being weird, <laughs> just trying out funky stuff? And then you're like, whoa, whoa, check this out. Look, you know, and that sort of thing. A uh, number of players, this is kind of self explanatory, I think, but maybe you haven't really thought a lot about it from a game studies perspective, the difference it makes. Yeah, if you're playing, a, if you want to make a chess game and you want to be single player, uh, then you have to have this, you really have to think about the AI, uh, the artificial intelligence, because otherwise, if it's too easy, you know, nobody's going to want to play the chess game. Uh, so you want to have the, a, a really smart opponent. Uh, they can play a good game of chess, and that's really tough. You know, people they're still trying to work on this uh, today. Uh, whereas if it's if you're just if it's just going to be with another human, you don't really have to bother with that. You know, a lot of people that's why they like the uh, multiplayer games so much because uh, you know if you're playing a Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter Two, something like Magic, you know, Magic, uh, any game with a competitive aspect, uh, you you probably pretty quickly learn how to beat the computer, and it's not that much fun anymore. Uh, so you want to play with a human because the human, of course, just like you, you know, they can come up with different strategies, do things you weren't expecting. It's usually a lot more fun. Uh, also, communication features. Again, you don't have to worry about players talking to each other in a single player game, <laughs> whereas a multiplayer game, that's essential. But maybe you don't want certain types of communication. You don't want the opposite team. You don't want to hear what the opposite team is saying. <laughs> or maybe you do, <laughs> but they don't want you to hear it. <laughs> uh Balancing, uh, we talked about that already. Uh, cheating, you know, that's it's not really such a big deal in a single player game. If you cheat, you know, it's almost like you're cheating yourself out of a fun game. Uh, whereas on multiplayer, though, that maybe you know, that could be money at stake, like this, the esports. You know, you don't want people cheating in that. Uh, there have been uh, busts uh, where they, you know, these players are cheating, they found some way to exploit the rules, or they literally have a hack. <laughs> Uh, so you don't want that. You know, think about MMOs, how mad you would be if some, you found out somebody was cheating and beating you that way. Uh, it wouldn't be very uh, fun. And then, of course, multiplayer games. Without those, you really wouldn't have eSports. You know, there are ways to make single-player games competitive. Again, if you watch Donkey Kong uh, or King of, King of Kong, I think, uh, there's a competition... It's not both people playing Donkey Kong at the same time or playing against each other directly. You know, it'll just be about who can get the highest score, uh, who can uh, get to the highest level, uh, who can play for the longest. Sometimes it's just like, how long can you play it before you just fall over? <laughs> uh, so there's ways to make those other kind of games competitive, uh, just not the same. Okay, to wrap up, they talk a little bit here again about what the future might look like, what are some of these novel genres, and sometimes something like Pokemon Go comes out and it makes a big splash and people are talking about it everywhere. You know, it's it's kind of new and hip because it's not just kids sitting on a couch looking at a TV. Uh, you know, this is on a smartphone and there's things you can do out in the real world to connect with and <laughs> find these... <laughs> You know, uh, I'm not. I'm, if you've never played Pokemon Go, uh, I suggest you try it out just to see what it's like. You know, it's it's kind of a neat experience, uh, at least to try once. Uh, now, whether or not this is like the future and a whole bunch of other games are going to copy this model, you know, of course we don't know yet. Uh, but the book speculates a little bit about some of the models. There's been this uh, back in the early 2000s, around the time of the Matrix. There's all this talk about mixed reality, and the idea was you'd be playing the game at home, and then maybe while you're at work, you get a text message, and that would be something in the game, something tied to the game somehow, and you'd want to go home, and uh, it would work somehow like that. Maybe you'd actually get a phone call, or you have to call somebody. Uh, so it's kind of bringing in different uh, media beyond the game. Uh, there were games that were uh, involved, like geocaching, I think. So you'd like go somewhere. You'd follow some clues, and then you get to the, an actual location, find a clue. <laughs> uh, just all kinds of stuff. Uh, I remember the QR codes, you know, those little weird squares you see sometimes with a weird, you sort of take a picture of it with your phone. You know, that was supposed to be a big thing uh, with gaming. I never really got into it. Yeah, your mileage may vary. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it is cool to think about 
And so you have the virtual reality, like the Oculus Rift. That's not what, really what we're talking about here. We're talking about uh, things that kind of go beyond the screen. So just things out in the real world, you know, have the Pokemon there on the, uh, you know, the field that you're looking at. So who knows? That, that could be a, a really interesting thing uh, for us if you're watching this like 10 years from now. <laughs> you might say, wow, he didn't see that coming. You know? All right. Thanks for watching. Uh, please do make a comment. Uh, ask a question. Let me know what you're thinking. Always lovely to hear from you. And I will see you next time.